everyone. Um, it's nine o'clock, a little bit later, so I think we're ready to start. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. My name is Elena Polivceva. I work for IETM, International Network for Contemporary Performing Arts. I'm happy to welcome you from Lyon, apparently a very beautiful French city. Um, I'm sitting in Théâtre de Célestin, which is hosting our IETM uh, plenary meeting. Um, a little bit more than 200 people came here physically, um, um, and um, it's definitely not the largest IETM plenary meeting, but perhaps it's going to be one of the warmest ones and definitely one of the most long-awaited meetings. But many of you, um, our friends, members, colleagues, partners, uh, could not join us physically here for one very obvious reason, but also for many other reasons. And that's why we tried and offer you um, also digital program uh, so that we could still have this collective global reflection moment to inspire, to exchange basically everything what ITM has been about in the last 40 years. And today we are almost ready to celebrate the 40th anniversary of IATM while emerging from a very particular period of time in a very strange world. And yet again, we're asking ourselves the question, how should we work internationally? How we, should we collaborate across borders? What is the future of international artistic exchanges in a world where environmental changes are so threatening, um, where imbalances and disparities be between countries and inequalities between people are only growing, where national borders are becoming stronger and where post-colonial legacies continue to persist. At IETM, we are, have always been critically reflecting on the values and modalities of cross-border collaborations. And today we're especially uh, trying to find more sustainable, more equitable, inclusive and fair ways of working across borders. And that's why we're increasingly getting curious about the emerging concept of translocality, translocality in the arts, which will be our guiding thread, uh, thematic thread in the upcoming couple of years. And that's the topic of our session today. The session will be recorded and we will share the content um, beyond this online moment with our partners, members and friends um, and any other audiences. And I'm very happy to welcome our panel, our experts. Uh, we have Martin Dorman with us, Dutch philosopher, writer, and poet, who has been exploring the concept of translocality in the arts and who will present us his perspective um, in a couple of minutes. We also have three wonderful art professionals with us from different parts of the world. Uh, Marta Kale, um, independent curator in the performing arts uh, from Poland. She was also facilitating uh, the trajectory post-national transnational artistic practices in the Reshape project, which um, has just recently ended. Very curious to hear your perspective, Marta. We have Helena Nassif um, from Lebanon, uh, executive director of Culture Resource. Um, organization, uh, non-profit um, regional organization that seeks to support artistic creativity in the Arab region. And we have our people belly um, based in Sydney in Australia, independent creative producer and director. And um, now I'm very happy to welcome Martin, our special guest, who will who will talk about translocality in the arts. Martin, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Please unmute yourself and I will mute myself because the floor is yours. Good morning. Do I have to share my screen, Elena? You do have to share your screen. Okay, there we are. I'm sorry. Yes. There is really no problem. We see your presentation. Great. Well, um, thank you very much, Elena, for uh, giving me the floor and for the invitation. Uh, my background, my first background is uh, philosophy. So I would like to start with some uh, generic observations. And the first is that, that the last two centuries, nearly all Western culture has existed in a national context. And of course, there were exceptions as well. Goethe used the concept of Weltliteratur in the early decades of the 19th century, referring to the international circulation of literary works. In his conversations with Eckermann, he spoke about Chinese novels and Persian poetry. 
and he predicted that world literature would replace the national literature of his days. I am more and more convinced, he said to Eckermann, that poetry is the universal possession of mankind. National literature is now a rather unmeaning term. The epoch of world literature is nearly there and everyone must help to hasten its approach. But hardly anybody did. Literature, including theater, became national literature in the 19th century. And it was only at the end of the next century that perspectives changed. In 1999, the French critic Pascal Casanova published La République Mondiale des Lettres, the World Republic of Letters, in which she skeptically discussed unequal power relations between different cultures. She questioned the nationalistic approach of literature in a Western colonial setting. I guess most of us agree about a structural change in the global perception of culture today. But I think it's hard to conceptualize this change in terms of internationalism or cosmopolitanism, since these concepts still contain a semantic inheritance of non-inclusive cultural dominance, mostly embedded in a nationalist framework. Although I'm a lover of theater, I'm not enough informed about the global networks in the performing arts. So my proposal to understand contemporary developments in terms of translocality rather goes back to an essay I published about the visual arts. And I hope it has some relevance for today's meeting. I began that essay with a visit to downtown Los Angeles. Within an area of two square kilometers, I found seven museums and I visited them all. On Olvera Street, I saw the oldest house in the city, the Avila Adobe. Around the corner was the United Methodist Museum of Social Justice. Only one small room in a church hosting some artworks full of social indignation. At the other end, I found the Museum of Contemporary Art, the MOCA, with their second venue, the Gavin Contemporary, in the opposite direction. And of course, there was the Broad, the museum of billionaire couple Ely and Edith Broad, with superstars like Liechtenstein, Andy Warhol, and Jeff Koons. In the tiny Chinese American Museum, which aimed to demonstrate that the Chinese were good Americans during World War II, I was the only visitor. Just as in the Japanese American National Museum, which brought forward that although the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, they could still be honorable heroes. It was a curious hodgepodge. Some museums had barely anything to do with art. But each of these museums embodied an idea. They had a story to tell. The Avila Adobe, as, at the Avila Adobe, as a historical location, tried to add a sense of the past to the soulless LA identity. And the Museum of Social Justice, as part of a small community, tried to draw attention to local inequality. Two museums were trying to raise empathy for the Chinese and Japanese minorities in the city. But the Broads pretended to share their wealth with the whole world. And the MOCA and its annex did neither seem to be interested in their surroundings. They were not local, they were global. Sometimes we forget that museums or other art spaces have always originated from an idea or a desire. This was so for the major museums in Europe, the Prada, Prado in Madrid, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the National Gallery in London, the Louvre in Paris. They were built to show off the splendor of the nation and to shape national identity through romantic cultural politics. They had a link to a specific location, a country, and later also a region or a city, not as something solely geographical, but always engaging with the community residing there. Just as the four small museums in downtown LA. 
The MOCA, however, is not about locality at all. It is about art in a global perspective, organized in a worldwide hierarchy dictated by prominent museums like the MoMA, Centre Pompidou, MOCA, Shanghai, and Tate Modern, and by the international art market in cities like London, New York, Hong Kong, Basel, Miami, Dubai, Mexico City, and New Delhi. More and more artists and art lovers are repelled by this pursuit of some sort of universal Champions League of art, where the auction prices driven up by the super rich ultimately determine the value of things. This conception of art is repulsive because it is deprived of any social context. It is often without any convincing background and without any sense of engagement to a specific audience. It is an art that no longer speaks to people, but instead dissolves in the empty world of celebrities, speculative investment capital and media hypes. Such skepticism was already articulated by artists in the 1980s. It started with punk's anti-establishment and anti-corporate activism, with the birth of the do-it-yourself generation, with the squatters movement, with rebellious youngsters trying to live a life outside of existing social structures. Because there was no place for them or because they did not want to take their place in that kind of society and bourgeois consumerism. It was during these years that artist initiatives started popping up. Artists occupied abandoned industrial buildings in order to make and to show work without inference from the market and from established institutions and official networks. These initiatives joined forces with bars, legal or not, alternative restaurants, theaters, clubs, and alternative shops. Artists' initiatives emerged across many different countries worldwide, and there was occasional contact between them, but the internet was still a baby and social media were non-existent. Few of those locally active artists participated in the world of institutions and the market. All of this changed by the end of the 1990s, when globalization gained momentum and digital data traffic, as well as human traffic increased rapidly, thanks to the blooming internet, cheap kerosene, and a booming travel industry. This industry provided an increasing movement of people across the globe, including refugees and migrants. Now that everything is entangled with social networks spreading out over the entire world, study and business traveling, tourism and refugee flows causing cultures to intermix, the dynamics between local and global art have shifted. On a global scale, like locally, the idea that there is a center is on the wane. According to art historian and curator Jamila Adeli, new hubs are formed in the Middle East, North Africa and South America, away from the existing Euro-American art centers. She speaks about an era of contemporary art that transcends not only territories and forms new central hubs, but initiates a paradigm shift towards a post-hegemonial, post-ethnic and post-Western notion of global art. What that paradigm shift is going to look like is hard to foretell, but the perception of art remains not unaffected, so much is clear. The undisputed Western view on art has become problematic, just like the idea that there is a hierarchical structure whose influence is exerted by one or two predominant centers over the rest of the world. Simultaneously, from the 1990s onwards, new local small-scale art spots arise on all continents, eventually forming new networks. A newly drawn up concept or buzzword to understand these developments is the concept we discuss today, translocality. The concept refers to specific practices, socially and geographically rooted, 
and aware of the global text we live in. This is how many art spaces nowadays work and think. They are locally rooted and globally connected. Slowly, museums begin to link the locally rooted to an international and global art discourse as well, in order to gain the approval and thus funding from local governments and foundations. Most large-scale institutions are not yet capable of implementing it, but in the age of globalization, increasing migration, diversity, and a more heterogeneous perception of culture, a translocal approach might be promising. Is this so for the performing arts as well? I'm curious to learn from you what you think. Probably the role of a global market is less important here. But going back to the concept of translocality, it's not completely new. The concept popped up in media studies earlier. However, the term was more employed in geographical and economic research on globalization and in migration studies to describe, for example, the relation between the specific location where a migrant is situated and the place of origin where he or she, thanks to mobile phone services and the internet, remains present in the lives of those migrants or refugees residing elsewhere. In that context, it is not so much the crossing of national borders itself that is at issue, but the connection between two places or between a specific location and a culture elsewhere. The relation is translocal rather than international, which comes closer to how the concept is relevant for the art world. Some 20 years ago, sociologist Stuart Hall observed that as a consequence of the decline of the traditional nation state, new forms of nationalism reinforced national identity at the expense of cultural diversity. And we can think in Europe at least uh, um, about examples like Hungary or, well, maybe some tendencies in Poland as well. But another consequence was that local identities of communities within a globalized world be became more relevant again. And these local identities focus less on their exclusivity, being aware of participating in that global world. Now, thinking about these local identities, I think it's good to observe that they are double rooted. They have a specific physical environment. That means that the natural or urban surroundings are relevant, such as rivers, harbors, or industrial sites, the sea. And there is always a specific social environment, the community, the people who have lived there forever, and those who have recently come to live there, the people who work there or used to work there, the history of the place. In short, the local is its landscape and the local is its community. Translocality here is a node of activities and relationships. It does not refer to a center anywhere and neither does it refer to nationality. And the local character of translocal art is no longer seen as marginal, like the metropolitan connotation of the word, word provincial still at times suggested. Translocal has emancipated the local. It has subverted the idea of a prominent center or a number of almighty centers towering over the periphery. In a global context, the translocal is aware of a worldwide, worldwide mobility, which is visible in mass migration and the diversity that comes with it. This diversity, I think, is a starting point and might be a source of inspiration for the translocal in art practices. In the translocal approach, the many voiced tragedies and traumas of the colonial past, local history, and the stories of new migrants from all over the world serve as a point of departure. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin.
that was very interesting and a lot of food for thought. And I'm very curious to, um, to hear what our other experts here, which are here today with us, think about it. And I think we are ready to jump directly to Marta Kale. Hello again, Marta. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Martin, for this extremely interesting food for thought. Indeed, um, it resonates a lot with uh, what you has, have just mentioned, Elena, with uh, my just previous, very, very recent experience and, and an extremely fruitful, inspiring experience um, of working within the Reshape project. But before going into that, I wanted to also um, kind of um, uh, reveal uh, the very context I'm, I'm speaking from as um, the situation I'm in at the moment very much informs the way of thinking about the possible concept of translocality and possible um, ways of working transnationally, if you like, or translocally. Um, and that very perspective is um, yeah, a perspective of a very fresh uh, migrant uh, in a very luxury situation migrant. This is very important to underline. But indeed, this experience of being uprooted, maybe temporarily for uh, from my local context, which um, is uh, still is, I perceive, um, a Warsaw and, and, and Polish um, performing arts landscape, and being put in a new one. And in, in my case, it's uh, it's a new context. It's the Dutch context, the context of the city of Utrecht. Um, it's it's really interesting to understand better how. Um, yeah, uh, being uprooted from the kind of um, local ground uh, challenges the way of um, firming your thoughts and kind of grounding them or landing them. And how that's a big question mark for now. I don't, definitely don't have an answer yet. How will that influence my own curatorial or research practices? That's really interesting. Um, and that's probably one of the biggest challenges um, I've been confronted with in my professional path. Um, and I think this is um, so um, influential because I do really believe that the contextualization of our work, that the very way how we situate it is really key for uh, both conceptualizing and reflecting on what we are doing, but also on, on the actual shape of what is being done. And that would be the, the, the matter of, of contextualization or of grounding the practice would be one of the main um, points I, I would love to tackle today. Um, but um, it's, it would be indeed, uh, I think, really interesting to start with the reshape perspective. And I would love to start with the, my, my utter gratitude to, to the group I was working with, um, which was an amazing group of uh, art practitioners from the performing arts field and visual arts field that actually have never, almost never met before. And um, what was really interesting, we were working in the frames of the transnational, postnational artistic practices, but we realized we had to, at some point, get rid of that framework. Like the notion of transnational and postnational was so challenging, was kind of vague for us at the vague for us at the moment. But also, um, it's literally meant something else for each of us because of the context we we're coming from. And therefore, at some point, we decided to kind of put it aside for a moment. We also felt um, it was definitely a very political matter, as the very concept of translocality in the arts is, obviously. Um, because on one hand, we felt it was really tempting to get rid of the nation framework and to liberate our minds um, to think otherwise, because I believe uh, we are kind of embedded in this realism of the nation state, and we still uh, tend to uh, think um, following these very patterns, which can be really limited. That's why I find the concept of the transloc translocality very tempting. But on the other hand, we do still feel the very burden of being situated in particular national borders, especially um, after the, the pandemic and all the challenges that you, Martin, just mentioned, um, the, um, the forced mobility or the displacement of, of many of us, um, the whole uh, situation of the refugees, this is uh, the moment when we can't escape 
the fact of being grounded in a particular a national context. And this is also the very reason why um, I kind of uh, decided to migrate um, the local context, the, the current situation and the local background of mine did not allow me to continue the practice kind of there's the situation when you try to root yourself in the ground but then at some point the, the ground is kind of expelling your roots and then you like it's it's kind of pushing them back and then you need to find another um another context or another yeah soil to root yourself in so this very political, very concrete material aspect of the national um, concept of the national state and the grit of the national of, of the countries um, being, for instance, able to move freely or not, or being displaced from one place to the other, that informed our work within the reshape very much. So we felt we kind of uh, would love to free ourselves from that concept, but we can't because it influences so much the very situation, the very different situations of each of us. And then at the end of the day, we decided to actually um, work on building kind of common ground uh, between ourselves, having in mind what we are bringing with uh, or what kind of a context and uh, local landscape, so to speak, shaped the way we think and we worked. And we were very much inspired with um, some attempts of, of uh, artists and thinkers who try to rethink uh, their position of, um, of being internationally, transnationally, translocally connected. One is the, the concept of Benjamin Ferdong, who at some point, a Belgian artist who at some point decided he would go to, for the world tour with his new performances in his own city of Antwerp. And, in that sense, he, the, instead of traveling all over the places in the world, he decided to really discover, uh, to think of his own city as a, as a land, as a, as, a, yeah, as a new landscape for himself and to discover much more, much uh, more of the layers of the city than he knew. Um, and the other um, really important concept for us was the concept of, of thinking with. Here I'm kind of uh, borrowing the concept from Donna Haraway and Maria Pig de Abaracasa. That was the thinking of not necessarily when we think about doing an artistic work or doing a curatorial work, not necessarily uh, to think about some topic or about someone or about some phenomenon, but or, or about uh, uh, the organism that is not necessarily human, but to think with them. So to kind of trying to um, shift the perspective and understand deeply the perspective of the other. And here, I, I think um, two points come that are really important for me when thinking about the possible um, unfolding of the concept of translocality in the arts. First is obviously that um, it's a very political matter. And in that sense, uh, I think it would be really important um, in order to build uh, sustainable translocal uh, alliances or relations, we do need uh, like time and space to understand what are the local contexts uh, we and our partners, colleagues, uh, partners in crime, where do they come from and what does it mean and how do we understand the notions that may seem the same as political, for instance, or political art. Um, so there is a lot of time and space needed to con contextualize and ground the ideas and, and to build meaningful alliances. And that's the second thought I wanted to share is that I really believe that the transla translocality needs alliances. and. Um, especially when we work uh, with, um, um, yeah, again, partners, colleagues, artists who uh, had to shift their context or who had to shift their perspective radically, who are kind of expelled from their ground, but also to basically um, understand better what made them uh, think or, or, or this way or, or um, create a given artistic practices. So I guess this, this two perspectives of the contextualization, situatedness, situatedness if you like, and uh, alliances would be uh, yeah, a key point for me at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. <clears throat> Very interesting. When, when you were talking and uh, also when Martin was talking, I thought that there is this mood of 
freeing yourself in this translocality concept or escaping. I think this whole idea of com coming up with a new concept is also about how to escape the national, the global, whatever else, which is seems to be kind of daunting. And another point which I also thought about when Martin was also talking is about time and space, because if it is about finding concrete audience, finding concrete situation, you need to be sure that you know what it is, this concrete situation. Otherwise, it goes again into superficial concepts of global assumptions that you know what it is about, but in the end, it's not the case. Thank you, Marta and um, Helena. Hello. Very curious to hear your perspective from the Middle East. Uh, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Martin and Marta. Uh, I'm very happy to be taking part in this session. Uh, IETM meetings have always been an important opportunity to engage in deep and illuminating conversations uh, when we were offline. Um, and I'm happy to be, uh, react to Martin's uh, concept of translocality in the arts. Uh, it was really thought provoking to read his contribution and to, to think of it from the perspective on, of an arts and culture institution supporting the arts in the Arab region and from the positionality of the southern Mediterranean uh, outside the borders of fortress Europe. Uh, to begin with, uh, I want to highlight that I found the concept of translocality extremely valuable, uh, mainly because of its moral underpinnings that give value to the local which is not, as Ma uh, Martin said, denigrated as provincial, but appreciated for its connection to landscapes and to communities in resistance to the cosmopolitan tradition and despite the power of global neoliberalism. It is this despite, however, which troubled me a little bit while trying to analyze whether the concept is helping us describe or analyze a new trend among cultural institutions who are resisting the global cultural hegemony by embracing diversity as a source of inspiration and the source of material for translocality in the art, as Martin said. So I would like to share with you three observations to contribute to the conversation. The first is who has access to the trans? Um, from our perspective, borders are still very much present and powerful, powerful systems of control. Figures from the Missing uh, Migrants Project, a project by the International Organization for Migration, tells us that 22,790 migrants are recorded missing in the Mediterranean Sea since 2014. Border control, uh, whether national or supranational, is part of an, an increasingly powerful and sophisticated systems of securitization, where individuals from the Southern Mediterranean and others across the globe, including artists, are recurrently perceived as threat and labeled as risk. International conventions like the 2005 convention recommending special treatment for artists' mobility, including an artist visa, is not always respected, not to say rarely respected. Uh, as a result, uh, the prefix trans does apply mainly to those with mobility privileges in a globalized world where everything is made more mobile except certain people. In this reality, the internet is a facilitator for the traveling of ideas, but it's not a tool of human mobility. The second observation is um, to look into the power dynamics between the trans and the local. Uh, Martin assumes that the Western perspective on art is no longer a matter of course, and the notion of a single world spanning hierarchy is fading. Uh, I would like to challenge this a bit, uh, I wasn't able to put together all the figures, but looking at budget figures of European public investment in the arts in comparison to governments across the Mediterranean divide so, uh, shows a huge discrepancy. Public funding remains important in building and maintaining infrastructures of the arts, including cultural spaces, venues, arts education and research, production and critique. Even when the translocal is no longer found in the public, funding frameworks, as Martin uh, signaled, I'm afraid it is these frameworks that allow for the ecosystem to exist in a manner that allows for the diversity of the translocal to sustain itself. In addition, uh, Bourdieu's notion of consecration within the cultural field further elaborates how social structures construct hierarchies within the local as well context. Within the increased weakening of the post-colonial state in our context, 
it is imperative to investigate whether the local can be the reference to the translocal or whether the trans will be in fact dictating how the local is going to represent itself, how it is going to commodify itself and how it's going to sell itself. In other words, hierarchies and structural inequalities go beyond spatial configurations. For even if there's a trend, and I believe there is a trend that uh, of uh, having multiple centers and the center and peripheries are being reconfigured at the moment. But these hierarchies are still very palpable in institutional histories and capacities, in access to resources, in media representation, etc. And localities within the Global South are still materially disadvantaged due to the failures of decolonization and the persistence of colonial and post-colonial legacies. The third observation is, uh, I think also Marta uh, discussed this, is like, what is the local? Um, and here maybe I'm speaking from the perspective of Europe uh, on what Martin calls it or um, uh, how he framed it, like seeing the rich polyphony of the colonial past, a local history and the stories of new migrants from across the world as fertile ground for artists. And I totally agree with Martin here. And I believe that the future of international collaboration starts with change at home in the sense that we need um, to live in and redefine a new locality that is not grounded in a xenophobic nation state view of the local. I mean, ideas of the local are not totally free from nation state ideologies. Um, for example, um, do we really care, for example, to emanci emancipate uh, a locality, an understanding of locality that is, for example, referenced in Asterix and Obelix? Uh, we need to be here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I like Asterix and Obelix. <laughs> Here we need to be careful uh, not to rom romanticize the local in our, in our efforts to de-romanticize the cosmopolitan. Uh, to conclude, uh, I believe the notion of translocality carried, carries a huge promise to conceptually contribute to imagining a new world. Uh, so thank you, Martin, for this. Few questions remain for organizations and thinkers um, interested in adopting this notion. Um, how can we engage in processes of resisting the power of existing borders? And here also Marta mentioned alliances and I think it's uh, extremely important. Do we need to couple our openness to international exchange with a process that leads to redefining the local at home? Are we agreeing that the new local requires a reconfiguring of new identities embedded in plurality and difference? And in, that would mean an increased sharing of power with outsiders becoming insiders in our context and in shedding deep held beliefs that are embedded in superiority claims. I think this is not an easy path, but like a promising one. Thank you, Martin, and thank you again. Thank you, Eliana. Very insightful and very right questions you are asking. I like how you actually looking inside what means trans and what means local and challenge a little bit the two. Uh, who has access to trans and also who has access to local and to which local. I think we definitely, well, our one hour is definitely not enough to discuss all that and I'm, I hope that we will have further discussions later. But now let's go to Australia. Pippa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Helena. And thank you so much, Martin, Marta, and uh, Helena for your observations. It's a, it's a really big topic and I'm going to throw it with another light because I'm in the evening on the other side of the world on Wongal country, which is the traditional name for the owners of this place, the First Nations owners of this place. Uh, and so I'm going to refute where Martin started that the last two centuries has been about national because for the last two and a half centuries in Australia since invasion, it's really been about the international uh, coming into a land that belongs to somebody else. 
and claiming it and then, uh, yeah, and claiming it as their own. And so we, we have enormous struggle in this country with that history. Uh, and I think just from a little personal anecdote, I, um, my family are the result, well, I am the result of three colonizing influences in this part of the world. My, the Welsh in New Zealand uh, for about three generations, the Dutch in uh, Indonesia for five generations, and then the English in Australia. So I really feel the, the, the pressure and responsibility for what it means to be living and constantly looking to back to Europe. Uh, in Australia, 80% of the population live on the coast. And there is, uh, there is a kind of supposition that, that many are afraid of the interior. Um, in fact, 30% of the current population, which is about 26 million, were born overseas. So we are on the coast looking to all the places that we come from in a rich multicultural nation, uh, dreaming of where our ancestors are buried. And for many, they're not buried here. Um, there are approximately 300 uh, language groups from the First Nations people in this country. And I need to be very clear that obviously I don't speak for any of them, um, but I have the great fortune of being able to work. I, ha I have worked with a number of First Nations artists. And then for the last two years, I actually stepped out of the arts and started working in uh, something called place-based social change. Um, and this is a very interesting new development here. There's a lot of government support for it. Um, and it's largely bringing an Indigenous lens into how we consider our place. And it's particularly looking at uh, disadvantage because uh, I'm very sadly, as a result of invasion and genocide, our First Nations, the First Nations people in this country um, are some of the most incarcerated in the world and uh, living in in some cases in abject poverty. However, what's incredibly important, apart from those terrible statistics, is that their connection to place is radically different from anything that I have experienced in Europe or in Britain where I've spent a long time. And part of that is that it's relational. So the the, the idea of being in a place in your country is about having responsibility for it and being connected to it in a way that is really very, very different from, um, yeah, from, from anything else that I've encountered overseas. And so, you know, it's almost, it's almost like saying that, that you have your grandparents, your ancestors are in the landscape and that therefore you have responsibility to them to look after it. And I think this is a really critical moment to be considering this perspective in relation to, to translocality because we have a, an environmental crisis of such magnitude that in this reimagining what the local means, surely we have to be not just simply thinking about the urban environment or the rural environment, but actually wherever we are, what is our responsibility to looking after those places from um, an environmental perspective? And I think that also then challenges us to think about how we um, and why we want to connect with other places because somehow it seems a little to me that we've become so obsessed for all the reasons that Martin articulated, so obsessed with being other places that actually a lot of the audiences, certainly this is true in Australia, a lot of the audiences uh, don't necessarily connect because the artists uh, have had to travel. Um, and so I think the role of the performing artist in the live space that is the natural environment is a really interesting, um, yeah, an interesting proposition to be completely reimagining that is not 
uh, about going into dark halls necessarily uh, with artificial lights and certainly not necessarily about being on um, Zoom. And in fact, I also want to acknowledge the Moekma Olon tribes of the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where Zoom is based, because we somehow imagine that this is some, you know, magical land, but actually it's also based on unceded uh, First Nations lands. Um, I also, I read something interesting the other day, which is that communication is set to uh, exceed aviation in terms of its carbon footprint. So that also raises some very, very interesting challenges for us in terms of if we can't travel as much, and I don't think we can, um, then we also can't do replace it with this virtual way of connecting. And so that raises some very interesting challenges in terms of why we want to reach across the world and how do we do that in a way that uh, is sustainable environmentally, but also is has a great curiosity for, for how we are different from each other. And I think that's probably enough from me, Elena. Thank you so much, Pippa, for a very interesting, nuanced perspective that you brought. I was wondering, Martin, after hearing um, these very strong and quite insightful interventions from different parts of the world, did you have any further reflections? Would you like to react to any of the ideas you have just heard? Oh, yeah, absolutely have. And I'm, I'm very grateful for all those uh, um, interesting reactions. It's such a pity that there's not much time to discuss them because all, all the contributors, I think, would be worth to have a reaction of or a discussion of at least half an hour or so. But we don't have that opportunity. So maybe you will forgive me that I just give some very uh, simplified uh reactions because i think we have just 12 more minutes left elena right yeah so i'll try to do this in three or four minutes is that is that okay then um to start with uh marta um i think she made some you made some very interesting points and uh, what is most striking and most important in your reaction uh, i think is the difficulties to leave the, the national framework behind the whole structure of thinking about art and about art practices and, and doing art as well. And I think that's based in, in what I often have called the, the romantic order. I think uh, I've done quite, uh, I've done some research on the influence of romanticism during the last 15 years. And I'm convinced that um, the romantic influences on on the art discourses of today are immense and we're not enough conscious of it so it's very hard for us to to understand our own culture and even our own identity our own personal identity without those romantic um romantic intuitions and feelings and the same goes for nationalism and i think many of us want to get rid of all kinds of nationalist forms of culture but it's not so easy uh, we can see it as a deep structure not only in the funding of arts but also the way we discuss it and the way we perceive it so i think that's a serious point to 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 discuss then um concerning the reaction of helena you said so many relevant things that it's a bit difficult for me to choose um but i think the first point that that you mentioned that that um the the, the question you ask who has access to the trans in translocal that's a very fundamental question and that that makes us think about the local like pippa did in quite another way um, and that also shows, I think, that this translocality concept is, is extremely interesting and promising. Um, although I agree with Helena that maybe my analysis is a bit too optimistic. And I don't see, um, let's say, translocality as something that's already there in the world, but maybe it's an instrument to understand things 
that are changing. And in the reaction of Pippa, I already was considering the question in how far uh, is this conference we are participating in right now a translocal phenomenon or not? And I think it became translocal thanks to Pippa in the first place because she explained so precisely her position, her personal position and the backgrounds and the dilemmas, but right from Australia and showing that she is in Australia at the same time, but things all related to the discussions we have right now. Going back to Elena just for uh for two other points if you don't mind um well i think uh, it's important to see the point you made with the help of bourgeau that also in local communities there are all kind of hierarchies that are still existing so that this translocality is not a kind of panacea a solution for everything um, and that we have to be conscious that it might be a conceptual instrument, but not a kind of ideology yet. Um, and well, I think what was interesting that the last point Helena made was that this this influence of the national framework was is very hard to devoid. Actually, more or less the same point Marta made in her way. Um, then. Uh, the last point concerning the reaction of Pepa, um, I think discussing the indigenous perspective is extremely interesting here because there you show, in other words, or in an other way, that this, this feeling of responsibility for a place is quite crucial also for translocality. And in my, in my opinion, I think this underlines the importance of the translocal in the sense that we can really learn from local communities, not just Western or global local communities or migrants, but also the people who are, are still living somewhere and that we have forgotten that it's their place in the first, in the first place. Well, this is just a few reactions, Elena. Um, uh, thank you very much for, for giving me the floor again. Thank you very much, Martin. Yes, we have six minutes to go, and I wonder if maybe someone from the participants would like to ask any question or to write any reaction in the chat. I do believe that in six minutes, everything can be still possible. Um, and while people are typing and while time is running out, I will start also kind of concluding the session. And I think what I really like about it, we just had one hour and I started this um, session with rather, um, let's say, like optimistic and maybe simplistic uh, statement that we are at IETM looking for better ways to work internationally, more sustainable, more inclusive and more equitable. And I very much like that in this one hour, we did not say that translocality is the way. I think we just said that this is not good, this is not bad. This is one of the ways. This is an interesting phenomenon and we don't know anything about it yet. We need to look into it. Um, but I think what we do uh, agree probably all is that um, and I, I, at IETM as a transnational network, we have always been challenging the notion of national and that's something we will continue doing. Um, and I think there is a question from Abigail. I wonder what is the place of language in this discussion? I don't know whoever would like to react, whoever has an opinion about that. Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in. I'm the native English speaker, so that makes sense, right? Because that is the language in which we're communicating, but of course, it's not necessarily everybody's native language for those who um, are listening and indeed the panel. Um, I think it's a huge issue. There's uh, a lot of recovery of language going on in Australia, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, there is a, a bigger move COVID really highlighted how problematic it is when we're not uh, enabling people who have English as a second language to understand all the nuances of lockdowns and crazy things. So there's a, a big move to make other languages more accessible. So not everything is in English. And certainly in, in the context of IETM, since I joined, uh, everything used to be in two languages that used to be in English and French, and we've lost the French. So actually, somehow, I think it's a yeah very pertinent I issue. 
Thank you for that, Ipa. Um, we have another question, um, which I read and I'm not sure it's written until the end. Maybe a word of, is missing here. What is the common denominator in the arts that surpasses all of us and in the arts? Whoever might have understood the question, maybe the question is indeed, what is the common denominator in the arts that surpasses all of us? Very philosophical question. Maybe the philosopher can answer. You mean me, Elena? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, of course, that was my question because I got the invitation and I was aware that it was about the performing arts and I proposed you to go back to an essay I wrote about the visual arts. So still the question is there, are there things in common? Is there a kind of common ground to discuss? And I certainly think it is. Although, as I said before, I think in the visual arts, the role of the market is much more explicit, but I think market principles play a huge role in the performing arts as well, maybe more invisible. Um, and then still this whole principle of translocality is not only about the arts, of course, it's, it's about um, generic developments all over the world that are so extremely complex. But at the same moment, I think that we can learn about the world if we if we are aware about how the arts are functioning nowadays, and maybe that offers quite a few opportunities for other fields as well. Yeah, thank you. Marta or Helena, would you still like to say anything before we close the session? Maybe just... Um... Maybe just a very short remark on um, on the tra tra tradition of, of romanticism that I've found extremely interesting. I just uh, would love us not to forget that um, there is this tradition and a burden coming with it, definitely, um, or at least a very high impact and influence on our way of thinking, of our way of conceptualizing and framing. And that's definitely a kind of uh, challenge when it comes to the um, to the notion of the national. But there is also a very material aspect of it uh, I wanted to highlight again, which is the very materiality of the border, the very materiality, material aspect of a nationalist movement that simply stops some of the artistic practices to happen or really make them difficult. There are all of the um, questions of the accessibility to the trans that Helena mentioned. So I just wanted us to, to highlight both perspectives, the, let's say, yeah, conceptual one, so to speak, and a very material one that directly influences the way we work and live. Thank you, Marta. Elena. Thank you, Elena. Um, maybe I, I just, because uh, the question is the common denominator in the arts. Uh, maybe two things is, uh, is we benefited somehow from globalization because it allowed us really to, to, to learn more about each other, to, to have the opportunity to, um, to experience uh, uh, things differently. Uh, we don't need to travel uh, hundreds of hours in order to, to relocate completely. We can visit and come back. Um, and then we had the opportunity to create friendships, to build real alliances because of trust, because building trust is important. Uh, and it's important, um, there's some like noise in the background, uh, but it's important to, uh, to, to keep the uh, to keep the opportunity for us to be connected, uh, not to think that like being uh, um, rooted in the local is, is a kind of uh, something that would uh, be enough. But at the same time, um, I think the question of um, why are we connecting to each other is, is a relevant and a very important question. And that uh, leads to the question of what's the common denominator, because like there are multiple uh, multiple reasons why arts uh, are, are very important. One of them is that they give us the words to know our own experience. Um, and this is uh, across all disciplines of the arts. And as a human species, and in order to preserve the planet and the environment, we need to be connected to each other's 
histories to each other's experience to each other's stories. Uh, and here the language question is uh, extremely relevant because then the question of uh, of um, the noise is not coming from uh, my uh, the the issue of uh, of language is linked to the issue of translation, and uh, it's an it's an important uh, issue for all of us to think about how how to work on on. Uh, how to include translation and to think of translation and the challenges of translation, not in the literal sense, but translation, like, is it possible like the, uh, to really understand each other? But from my perspective, I believe it is. Thank you. Thank you, Helena, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marta, Pippa, Martin, and Helena for this, I think, quite insightful and dynamic exchange. And I think we raised a lot of questions when we actually got also quite some answers to some of our questions and I see there are some reactions in the chat and we don't have time for that anymore but the discussion is to be continued because as I said at IET and we're set to discover to explore to investigate translocality it will not escape us in the next couple of years so stay tuned there will be more content there will be more possibilities to discuss this topic to exchange go deeper um, thank you all. Thank you all the participants. And I see people did not leave us even after we went over one hour. So that's impressive. Have a good day. Have a good evening, uh, good afternoon and good life. Uh, we see you again somewhere, hopefully physically uh, soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you. It was. Thank you, Martin. Thank you.